Yeah, thank you for your patience. Sorry we're a little late. Um, today we have Nina Rizmo, who is one of the founders of Paper Zero, actually. She's a third year uh, German student, PhD student, and she'll be talking today on gender and feminism critiques of mainstream economics. So if we could all please welcome Nina. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, so I'll just start off with a passage from an interview with Nancy Fraser, um, who is one of contemporary critical theories, but also Marxist feminists. And Marxist feminism is kind of the form of feminism that I will try to introduce today. And in response to a question, um, Fraser said that for her, feminism is not simply a matter of getting a smattering of individual women into positions of power and privilege, within existing social hierarchies. It is rather about overcoming those hierarchies. And this requires challenging the structural sources of gender domination in capitalist society. Above all, the institutionalized separation of two supposedly distinct kind of activities. On the one hand, the so-called productive labor, which has historically been associated with men and remunerated by wages. And on the other hand, the so-called caring activities, often unpaid and still performed mainly by women. In my view, she says, this gendered hierarchical division of uh, labor or something between production and reproduction is a defining structure of capitalist society and a deep source of the gender asymmetries hardwired in it. And I'd like to draw your attention to three points which uh, Fraser makes here. So firstly, she points to different forms of feminism. One would be the so-called liberal feminism, which is probably one that we are all most familiar with. And this is what I highlighted here in blue. So it's about getting individual women, women into positions of power. So it's the emphasis is on the individual and actually on the woman's own responsibility to, to, to get higher up in our societies. And the liberal feminists see uh, the remedy to overcome those gender inequalities primarily in reforming legal systems. So um, kind of a contemporary example of those policies is, are those positive discrimination policies, for example, where a certain job ad is open only to women or where certain committees need to meet a quota of certain number of females in there. And then the form of feminism that Fraser represents is the more radical or also Marxist feminism. And they see the root of uh, those gender inequalities lies much deeper, not just in those certain legal um, constraint, but in the actual socioeconomic system. So basically capitalism is the cause for a suppression or an oppression of women and in to truly emancipate women um, is, can, only done, can only be done by overcoming the capitalist structure. And we have to bear in mind that liberal and Marxist feminists are not entirely uh, always opposed to each other. Um, for example, the Marxist feminists would not always argue that the positive discrimination policies are a wrong way of going about um, trying to promote status of women in society, they would just say, well, it's not sufficient. Um, then um, just a few words more about Marxist feminism. S sometimes that can be taken as a paradoxical term because Marxism and feminism are also two political ideologies which are not necessarily always compatible with each other. <coughs> One way in which they are, for example, contradictory is um, in which social group they emphasize, they focus their political action on Marxists, prioritize, prioritize the proletariat, the working class as the most suppressed group of our society, uh, whereas the feminist, for the feminists, these are women. However, what those two um, ideologies do have in common um, is this idea that um, people or subjects or individuals are historically constituted so that 
we are the product of our circumstances and of our history. As opposed kind of to mainstream economics, which promotes this idea that rational individuals are born um, with already innate preferences and they act on those accordingly. Um, but what is distinct for feminists is that they make this claim about the historical and social constitution of subjects, specifically with respect to women or gender more broadly. And one of the foremost feminists, um, Simone de Beauvoir, she was a part of the so-called second wave of feminism, which started in the late, in the second half of the 20th century, um, nicely summarized this idea that um, that basically um, gender is socially constituted. It's a role that is performed and it's not something we are born with. Uh, sorry. Que j'aimerais bien pouvoir expliquer. On ne naît pas femme, on le devient. Oui, c'est en somme la formule qui résume l'ensemble de mes thèses. Et ce qu'elle signifie est très simple c'est que être femme, ce n'est pas une donnée naturelle. C'est le résultat d'une histoire. Il n'y a pas un destin biologique, psychologique qui définisse la femme en tant que telle. C'est une histoire qu'il a faite, d'abord l'histoire de la civilisation, qui aboutit à son statut actuel, et d'autre part, pour chaque femme particulière, c'est l'histoire de sa vie, en particulier c'est l'histoire de son enfance, qui la détermine comme femme, qui crée en elle quelque chose qui n'est pas du tout une, une donnée, une essence, qui crée en elle ce qu'on a appelé quelquefois l'éternel féminin, la féminité. Et plus les études psychologiques sur les enfants s'approfondissent, plus euh, il est sensible, plus on voit avec évidence que vraiment le petit bébé féminin est fabriqué pour devenir une femme. Il y a là-dessus un excellent livre que l'Italienne vient d'écrire, Elena Bellotti, ça s'appelle Du côté des petites filles, et on montre comment dès... Ok, I think you get the idea, although it's worth watching the whole interview. Um, can we... Mm, and then the other kind of main premise which um, joins Marxism and feminism um, is the idea that uh, knowledge is not simply a way we understand reality, but it's actually an instrument of social domination. Um, and th that this is kind of one of the main messages or take home idea messages I would like um, to convey today. Um, and we kind of have to bear in mind that that is not something that only feminists or only Marxists claim um, that knowledge is an instrument of domination. However, what feminists, how feminists are distinguished um, in conveying this is that they make this claim particularly with respect to women. So they see that knowledge plays uh, a political role in suppression of women. Um, Okay, and then this leads me to the third point which Fraser makes um, when she, um, she says that um, th this division between productive and reproductive activities in our society, and I will come back to that at the end, um, is uh, one of the, deep, this division that exists is one of the deep sources of gender domination. And here she doesn't only talk about kind of the real material division of those activities so that there are actually some practical differences between those types of work, but she also just talks about the conceptual differ differentiation which we make between production and reproduction. Um, and in, in that sense, she sees that those, making those conceptual divisions is then actually a tool of um, gender domination. And one of the main functions of feminist and gender critique is actually simply uncovering of pointing to those neglects and oppressions and divisions which play a certain political role. And then the function of feminist economics, which is kind of then the next step, is then trying to reconstruct anew um, how we understand reality 
uh, by actually then including those omissions and trying to get rid of certain biases. Um, so I think I've spoke, you got kind of probably the idea and you probably know already quite a lot about what feminism is, but um, it's good to bear in mind that uh, we understand feminism both as a social movement and as a field of, um, of studies, as a specific discipline. Um, and historically, um, we understand feminism has developed in three waves. It started in the late 19th century with fight for extension of voting rights to women. And then we have the second wave um, in 1960s, which is um, of which the Bois was part. Um, and they, they fought for women's rights, not only in the public space, but also in places like uh, in family um, and in workplaces. Um, and then we have the third wave in the 80s, 90s, which is kind of an extension of the second wave, but also its critique um, of the second wave, saying that um, second wave feminists focused mostly on middle aged white women and kind of forgot, have forgotten about the women of the third world of race, of color, or, and of queer as well. Mm, so then, um, but as long as we talk about feminism mostly as a theoretical approach, then it um, overlaps quite to a great extent with gender studies. Um, so, and in that sense, kind of women's study or feminism is, is, is a category of gender studies, but then gender studies includes also women's studies and LGBT. Um, and it's not as explicitly um, politically oriented. And there is actually a gender studies department in Cambridge. There is, I think, even a, a master's and a PhD um, program. One of the kind of key conceptual differentiations that gender studies as a field came up with was this division between sex and gender. And sex is kind of a purely biological disposition, um, whereas gender is actually a social role. So this is what De Beauvoir was also talking about. And, and now everyone accepts this, but this actually only emerged like in late eight, 1960s. And the last kind of operating concept today is mainstream economics. I assume I, mostly you are economists, but um, here I will kind of um, under, use mainstream economics basically as synonymous with neoclassical economics. And that is based on a set of assumptions of autonomous rational individuals, individuals acting to maximize either their utilities if they're consumers or their profits if they're firms. Um, and they always, they always know what is best for them. And although this is kind of very obvious, still it's often, I think, also important to emphasize that neoclassical economics is economics of a specific socioeconomic system, and that is of capitalism. It doesn't talk about um, economics from the start of history until the, the end. Um, so, um, I will, of course, I cannot give you like an overview of all the criticism that feminist and gender studies people make of economics, but I kind of categorize them into two. One, two. Um, one is a more general one, which is aimed at um, kind of the philosophical foundation of neoclassical economics. And the second one is a, a more concrete one. Um, and I will focus, focus on that division, which I already mentioned. Uh, between the reproductive and productive activities. And this concrete um, type of criti critique is um, kind of goes back to what I already also referred to earlier, is to pointing certain biases and certain neglects that mainstream economic does. So the first, the, the more general philosophical or methodological criticism, if you want, um, is that um, feminists um, claim that mainstream economics believes that it is um, an objective representation of reality, but instead, uh, for, for feminists, it's actually um, a normative construction. Um, and this is quite easy to understand if we accept the fact that 
um, theories and models and definitions of economics or of any science um, don't come to earth by some kind of a divine intervention, but they're actually produced by the, by the scientists, by the economists who are part of um, a certain community. And if we remind ourselves back to the, to the starting idea that here we accept the fact that as subjects, as individuals, we are always a product of our environment, then it's very obvious that then also those economies who are functioning within a cer certain society will be influenced by certain norms and values that prevail there and that those norms and values will be then reflected in the theories themselves. Mm. Then, um, but th this idea that theories are social constructions should not be undertaken that anything goes, basically that there are no standards of truth or of reliability uh, to which we can turn to. Um, we can still differentiate between what is, uh, what is a better, what is a worse theory, but still what we always have to keep at the back of our minds um, is that those standards of truth and of reliability are, um, are not universal and they are kind of specific to a certain time, a certain area, um, certain society. And um, this, um, to better kind of understand this, um, I think already two years ago when I gave my first paper zero lecture, I drew this diagram. So some of you have already seen it. Um, but kind of the epistemology that mainstream economics conforms to and that feminists are critical of is the so-called Cartesian dualism, <laughs> um, which sees um, matter, so the external reality and ideas, knowledge, the mind as two separate spheres. Um, <coughs> okay, this works. So if we have here um, kind of matter, um, and here we have mind, and then the, the neoclassical economists believe that already here in the external reality we have certain objects, for example, such as women um, and men. <laughs> and then what we actually do when we try to understand what that reality is, is simply to, to create a certain mapping, mapping um, into concepts. And then here then we have, what is this, men. And then here we have the, those categories which we operate with. Um, but kind of an alternative, epistemological framework doesn't draw this neat line between the external reality and knowledge. So there is no this. Um, and they see there are many, many things happening in reality. So there is kind of um, like a mass of things which, and we can then create kind of a, an infinite number of different mappings into how, how we understand it. Um, and um, they, they understand basically that the reality is com is, has kind of infinite number of different particularities. And then um, those can then be translated into, into ideas. And then what is then the idea is presented then as an essence of, of that reality. But um, for them, how this, that mapping happens is not <coughs> completely arbitrary, but um, is kind of determined by certain interests that prevail in society. Um, so if we have kind of a different society, um, they, they would kind of create an alternative um, mapping to, to our own ones. And this is kind of what feminist economists try to do, is they say basically mainstream economics is um, portrays a picture of reality composed of men told by men and the alternative they try to create is actually to tell a story of reality of which women are part and also through the perspective of women. Um, is that more or less clear? Yeah, I, sometimes I feel I go on, sometimes I feel I don't explain it well enough. Then maybe I just turn to the concrete criticism. Um, 
Um, so this is the idea that certain types of human activities are basically excluded from economic theories. And a specific type of activities, which we um, can call either reproductive activities or then housework. And the, re the idea of reproductiveness comes from the fact that they are there only kind of to enable or to maintain the functioning of certain other activities. So cooking, childbearing, taking care of the elderly all come under that um, classification or category. Um, and we know that um, one of the definitions of mainstream or neoclassical economics is that um, it tries to explain how things are exchanged in the most optimal way. But kind of the stuff that it ex exchanged, these are goods or services or also kind of, I don't know, financial assets, um, they are, they, th those are kind of the objects that, that are produced. Um, and how do we decide what are those objects that, that are produced or that are kind of taken into account is those um, in which we get something into return. So those that have a certain monetary value. And those that are not are basically not considered as a productive activity or as work for that matter. And the um, easiest way to, to see that is um, to look into what is included in GDP, right? Um, there, um, housework is not included, so um, it is not counted as work. Um, but this becomes, and kind of coming back a little bit to how we try to understand the world, is by basically um, we decide what is important and what is kind of less important. And perhaps kind of those neoclassical economists decided that, well, the, the productive activities are just more important and that's why we can focus on, on them and kind of neglect the rest. But kind of that picture falls apart if we actually try to um, neglect or um, to stop doing all the reproductive work that happens in the society. Then nothing would function anymore. I mean, the only way why we can work eight or 10 hours a day is because someone else is doing the work at home. And this, is, this was actually also one of the main um, critique of um, Marxist <coughs> feminists, but then of a certain Marxist idea who also emphasizes the primacy of production um, as opposed to, to reproduction. And um, they say, well, reproduction is just as important um, as, as production, so there is really no reason why we should not talk about it as much as about productive activities. Um, so kind of the, 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 the housework activities are important for kind of maintenance of society at the very social broad level, but then also at the personal level. Um, there is another kind of radical feminist to whom I will come at the end, Silvia Federici, um, and um, she, she kind of uh, nicely says that the only way why, are, why we are able to do the boring, often, I don't know, also humiliating job, either in assembly lines or in office, is because we know there is someone back at home who will kind of offer kind of unconditional care and love and take care of us. Mm, but then we still, if then we agree that reproductive and productive activities are just as equally important, the question arises, but then why do we just talk, focus on productive activities? Um, and then we come back to one of the ideas I pointed out at the beginning, one of the take home messages, um, is that knowledge is not simply a representation of reality, but is a tool of social domination. So the fact that housework has been excluded from economic theories can be understood as a way of basically um, suppressing women, of, of limiting, of restraining their power. Um, and for Federici, this form of oppression, so oppression um, targeted at women, is kind of the most, the most mystified, the most violent, the most pervasive 
kind of um, oppression that capitalism does. And, he sa and she says, all those, although the workers are of course exploited and aline alienated from their environment, they still are recognized as workers because they get a wage in exchange, although that wage is not a fair remuneration of their efforts. Still, they have a certain identity, um, whereas housewives are not. Um, and she says that the unwage condition of housework has been the most powerful weapon in reinforcing the common assumption that housework is not work, thus preventing women from struggling against it. Uh, okay, how are we doing with time? Um, maybe I just point to two um, other concrete critiques of um, feminist um, critique of economics and then come to conclusion. Mm. So I said one of the main functions of that type of criticism is simply kind of pointing to different neglects and biases. And uh, for example, feminists point to the fact that the, the, in the representative individual in economic models, so the autonomous self-interested individual is actually is male because those characteristics of autonomy and of selfishness we historically associate with masculinity. And the same goes more broadly for, for economic method. So um, norms such as objectivity, separation, logical consistency, individual accomplishment, abstractions, lack of emotion. Again, those are um, masculine characteristics and they are characteristics of economics. Um, and on the other hand, we have the, the, femi the feminine sphere which encompasses values such as subjectivity, connection, intuitive, understanding, cooperation, emotion, concreteness, and those are all um, kind of values, norms that are looked down upon by economists. Um, okay, so for conclusion, I would like to read you a poem which was composed by the, <laughs> the Silvia Federici, that uh, feminist Marxist, um, um, she was, so she's still alive, but she was also very influential um, in practice, particularly in 1960s, where there was this campaign, um, wages against housework. Um, it, took, it started in Italy, but then kind of spread around the world. And I think it kind of nicely summarizes some of the ideas I was talking about today, especially about the, the reproduction and production as two supposedly um, distinct type of activities. Um, no. Oh yeah, this is another, uh, but now you can't see anything. Um, oh, no, either one. Maybe I will just have to read it from here because it will take a while and then you can look at it at the end. Um, so um, Federici said, um, they say it is love, we say it is unwaged work. They call it frigidity, we call it absenteeism. Every miscarriage is a work accident. Homosexuality and heterosexuality are both working conditions. But homosexuality is workers' control of production, not the end of work. More smiles, more money. Nothing will be so powerful in destroying the healing virtues of a smile. Neurosis, suicides, desexualization, occupational diseases of a housewife. Okay, this is all for me. Um, if you have any questions, um, please ask. Thank you very much, Nina. But um, I'm sure you'll agree it was a very interesting lecture. Um, so we've still got 10 minutes or so for questions. So I'll open it up. Yes. Um, sort of in passing at one point, you mentioned that there are notions of truth or verifiability that aren't agreed upon. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? Um, basically, that there are, there are no universal, unique standards of truth that would be valid throughout history. Uh, yeah, that there is basic, that truth as such is not unique. 
and that there are different forms of truth. So yeah. a lot of people nowadays would talk about like scientific method and reproducibility. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree that that's a subjective choice. Mm -hmm. Are there people who are questioning that substantially nowadays and proposing an alternative framework? Um, well, or is it just that historically there have been? No, no, no. I mean, a lot of kind of the social sciences and then humanities um, there the consensus actually is the fact that there is no unique truth and that there are um, just different ways of subjectively understanding it. And that is kind of the mainstream there, as opposed to kind of in natural sciences or in economics. Yeah? More questions? Yeah, yeah no, no uh, comment, but not exactly sure I agree that capitalism is in any way dependent on the suppression of women. If that was your point, I mean. Well, that was not my point. That was yes, m point made by many <laughs> of Marxist feminists, uh, and by I mean, basically one of the um, main claims of, of Federici um, is not only what I was talking about about the reproduction and production, but she also. Um, looks historically, even kind of before the rise of capitalism, of kind of how women have been systematically oppressed. And she looks at, for example, as witch hunt, as a way of trying to marginalize, to take away power from women. Okay, no, yeah. just more of a comment that, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't see capitalism breaking down if there were some mechanism for paying women or a more equal distribution of housework and housework being paid, say, by state transfers, which I think Venezuela does now. I, I don't actually see this. I mean, historically, of course, there's a lot of repression, but I don't see yeah. it crashing in any way if, if, well, even today, not just historically, but I don't really see it crashing. Well, then um, the question is kind of to, to what extent or how deep do you understand the suppression uh, um, and is? And for example, the liberal feminists, they would definitely agree with you. It's just kind of about the redistribution, it's about the reform, and then we will have perfect gender equality. Um, but kind of that goes more generally back uh, to the idea that kind of capitalism is the root cause of all kinds of oppressions. And if we actually really want to overcome them, is by changing the system from the fundamentals up. Uh, yes. yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question that ties into this question, mm -hmm. and somebody you brought up at the beginning, actually, when mm -hmm. you um, cited it's Nancy Fraser in Stone, isn't it? The um, the first interview that brought up. It was um, G Gary Gutting. Yes. Yeah, that's the it, one. A recent interview. Yes. Which is all to do with the idea of um, how Sheryl Sandberg's leaning in involves leaning on, which was, I think, the. So yeah, the, the general the overall yes. phrase of it, basically. So this is the idea of how... So the capitalist structure, to a large extent, depending on the construction of the public and the private domain, mm -hmm. and the separation, which means that at the point when we have complete gender equality, whether or not that will start to deconstruct that kind of separation, this dichotomy that I think you were talking about at the beginning, mm -hmm. which I understand in terms of also to do with the kind of the science value split that took place in economics as well. So of course the thing that Fraser is talking about is that the problem of leaning on when you lean in and how we start to kind of work our way through that system and break that down. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily the capitalist structure starts to fall apart, but it starts to become tested in terms of how it can deal with potentially a private public breakdown. Yeah, and, and I mean, then probably different people kind of dispute, yeah, that it will inevitably break if we actually want yeah. to achieve the final. Or it evolves in some other capacity. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, at the very back. Yeah, I was just going to ask um, how much you thought the Marxist uh, feminist framework to critique capitalism can deal with intersections like race? And yeah, I, I mean, this is what I kind of hinted at at the beginning. Uh, 
that uh, there were kind of many contradictions between Marxism and, and feminism. And an easy way out of this is there, there are many different forms of Marxism, right? And then there is this, there is uh, originally this orthodox scientific Marxism, which of course did not pay um, any attention to other social divisions than those that exist on the basis of economic structure, so between capitalists and the proletariat. But then, um, kind of in the second half of the 20th century, um, various other perspective, perspectives were kind of influenced um, by, by Marx's idea, then kind of incorporated them um, into then pointing also to other social classes, uh, such as gender, race, and so on. But yeah, so he kind of the, when, when one talks about Marxist feminists, it's just important to bear in mind yeah, that they are not kind of the, the hardcore orthodox Marxists, we just talk about class. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Um, I, that's not something I know a lot about, but from what I recall from my um, conversations with other people, Marx was also writing uh, quite important uh, pieces on alienation of uh, labor from laborer. Mm -hmm. uh, I so my question is: Do you know any interesting developments in Marxist feminism that uh, kind of well develop on that idea? Um, well, it's for example this one, like desexualization. Um, this for me, is partially kind of synonymous with alienation, so that basically we have some certain ability, for example, to, to be a sexual being, but then because we are kind of objectified, that's kind of taken away from us, so we become uh, detached, al alienated from ourselves. So, I mean, because Marx, Marx may make this argument particularly with, with respect to, to labor, so to work, so the productive activity as kind of the most essential um, most important activity of, of human beings, but of course I think it, it, we can perfectly make it with respect to other capabilities or values we have. Any more? Uh, okay, well thank you very much for your really interesting questions. Before you go, um, just a quick announcement that the CSEP lecture this week will be on Friday at 5.30 and it's on Corbynomics. Um, and like the implications of the sort of policies that Jeremy Corbyn has and, and what potential they might have. So I think it will probably be a really interesting one. So that's a 5.30, um, a location to be confirmed. Um, other than that, thank you again for, for all coming. If there's anyone who's not on the mailing list and you'd like to, please just come to the front um, at the end. And otherwise, let's all just uh, thank Nina one last time.